Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Ian Spangler. I work here at the Leventhal Center as Assistant Curator of Digital and Participatory Geography. Uh, and you're joining us today for a program with Katie Calandriello and Seth Kaplan from Transit Matters, an organization that advocates for better public transportation and mobility uh, across the Commonwealth. Uh, we're going to be learning more about public transit advocacy and transparency uh, from a reflection on their award-winning data dashboard tool. So we're really excited to get into this today with, uh, with Katie and Seth. Before we begin our program, I want to take note for a moment of the complicated and contested threads that are woven through historical geography. The place that we now call Boston is the ancestral and current home to indigenous peoples. The Massachusetts people lived for thousands of years and still live today on the Shawmut Peninsula. The metropolitan region is also home to other tribes, including Mashpee, Aquina Wampanoag, and Nitmuk Nations. Copley Square, where the Leventhal Center and Boston Public Library are located, sits atop a filled tidal estuary that once featured some of the most advanced marine agricultural techniques in North America. And the maps that are in the Boston Public Library's collection bear witness not only to the histories of colonial expropriation, but also to conflicts over labor struggles, racial segregation, and environmental justice. In many cases, these maps don't simply document these stories, but actually played a role in making them happen in the first place. So through all of our programs here at the Leventhal Center, we encourage our visitors to consider how these histories still exert real effects on the present day. Today's talk is also part of our ongoing exhibition, Getting Around Town, Mapping Four Centuries of Boston in Transit. In this show, we explore the long history of the transportation infrastructure in and around Boston. The many historic maps in the show depict colonial era ferry service, rapid expansion of the private railroad networks, and the nation's first subway here in Boston, the modernization of the T, uh, and unbuilt transit possibilities as well. Our team curators worked with our K-12 education team to create their own maps for the exhibition uh, that in many cases highlight the uneven ways that transit benefits different residents depending on where they live. And lastly, as part of the exhibition, we invited map makers and transit enthusiasts to submit their own speculative maps of Boston's transit system. We've posted these maps temporarily on display in the Leventhal Center vestibule, and we invite you to stop by the center and vote for your favorite one before Friday, February 23rd, the end of this week. One of the things that this show brings into sharp relief uh, is how Boston's modern transit systems are built upon the compounding choices, investments, mistakes, and beliefs of the past, and that it takes significant work to undo the things that have made, been made physical with infrastructure and policy and investment or lack thereof. With their data dashboard tool, Katie, Seth, and the rest of the team at Transit Matters give us a profoundly useful way to both understand the limits of our current transit systems, as well as imagine better ones moving forward. So on that note, I am excited to hand it over to Katie Calandriello, Policy Analyst and Program Manager at Transit Matters, and Seth Kaplan, Volunteer at Transit Matters, who will take it away from here. And as a note, please feel free to put questions or comments in the chat throughout the talk. We'll have time for Q&A at the end. Katie and Seth, take it away. Thank you, Ian. Um, I can quickly introduce Transit Matters. Um, so we are a transportation advocacy nonprofit that is data-driven and people-focused with the goal of promoting an equitable, sustainable, and robust transportation network in Massachusetts. And in my role as programs manager and policy analyst, I lead a lot of our campaigns that are primarily volunteer-led. So I lead our next-gen bus team, which works to build um, a better bus system um, in Massachusetts, particularly with the MBTA, but um, one of our goals for this year is to expand out to RTAs. Um, we've done a lot of really fun projects in the past with our most recent being a poster project in bus shelters throughout Boston, um, where we had an interactive poster with a QR code where riders could learn more about bus priority infrastructure and bus bunching um, and how to advocate for a better bus network. Um, I also lead the Mobility Hubs campaign um, 
where we build physical mobility hubs um, and nodes of transit to encourage multimodal transportation. Our most recent project was in Lynn, where we upgraded seven bus shelters um, in partnership with the city of Lynn, ITDP, and ad hoc industries um, with art, bike racks, wayfinding signage, um, and um, QR codes where people can read live schedule information. Um, and then, of course, the labs team. Um, this is probably our most notable claim to fame and how most people interact with us as an organization. Um, you may have heard of us in the globe um, or looked at the dashboard yourself um, made by our labs team to get uh, a clear idea of what's going on with the T and maybe get some more transparency on current events. Um, but this is very, very volunteer led. Um, and Seth is one of our incredible volunteers who's been with Transit Matters longer than I have and is um, you know, crucial to building our tools and knows much more than I do. Um, but I will pass it over to Seth. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for that intro, Katie and Ian. Uh, my name is Seth, uh, software engineer by day, Transit Matters, volunteer, train nerd uh, by night. So I'm glad to be here. Uh, Thanks for, thanks for having us. So I have a little bit of a presentation today uh, just to talk about our data dashboard um, and a couple other tools that uh, we have going on and then tell uh, a couple stories about things that we've done and uh, you know media surrounding us and whatnot. And then hopefully you can answer some, some fun questions and get some cool new uh, tidbits about the META. So yeah, I wanted to start it off with a, you know, a quick intro into what is Transit Matters Labs. Uh, so in 2018, uh, before I was a uh, part of Transit Matters, a group of you know software engineers, data scientists, et cetera, transit people uh, decided to get together and see if there was a way that we could find some information about the MBTA, make things a little bit more transparent, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're, we're lucky that the MBTA is uh, you know pretty good about providing a lot of data for us to use. Um, that's not the case with a lot, of, uh, a lot of other transit agencies. So we take advantage of that uh, in full force. Uh, I want to highlight a couple of our other projects that we have going on in case you were interested in checking them out. We have our regional rail explorer um, that'll take you through a uh, you know theoretical uh, you know how things could be if we electrified the whole commuter rail line, which is something that Transit Matter is pushing for. We also have our new train tracker. If you were ever curious uh, and wanted to try and hop on a new uh, green line or red line train, you can track them on here. Uh, I was really excited to do that when you know the first uh, new green line uh, trains came out. And uh, yeah, there's usually only one new red line train, which is kind of sad. So, uh, but it's fun if you want to try and track it. We also have our COVID recovery dashboard. Uh, if you're interested about how you know. Uh, the MBTA has recovered since uh, since COVID. Uh, a lot of transit agencies have taken a pretty big hit in terms of ridership. Um, so it's uh, interesting to see how the MBTA continues to you know, try and solve those problems. Um, and yeah, this is uh, what we're here to talk about mostly is our is our data dashboard, kind of our, our flagship tool. Um, I wanted to go through and highlight some features, um, tell some stories about how things came to be, some, you know, a little bit of technical stuff. I try and won't get too deep into the nitty gritty, um, but I think it'll be it'll be fun. So uh, to start, I wanted to you know, give a, a little bit of a high level definition of some of the, uh, the data points that we'll be mostly highlighting. Um, the first being travel time, which is you know pretty self-explanatory. It's how long does it take to uh, get from one stop to another? Um, on the screen, I have an uh, alewife to Park Street from today. So if you were on a 7.30 train, uh, you might have had a 40-minute commute from ALF to Park Street, which might have made you uh, really sad. And I took this at, I think, 5 o'clock, and you'll notice that there's no data after 2.30, and that's because there was a fire at Kendall MIT, and they bust between Harvard and Park Street. So reflected in the data, as in there is there is no data for that, for that time. Um, the next... Uh, Kind of definition that I want to talk about is headways, which is the time between trains arriving at stations. Um, you might, uh, you'll, you'll notice these if you go to a train station and you'll see, you know, uh, Alewife, uh, eight minutes or Braintree, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we track how often trains come and that's a good, uh, a good notion to figure out like 
what's the level of service? You know, how often, if I, if I go to a station, how likely is it that a train is going to come sooner or later? Um, and the variability of these things makes it really hard for folks to like accurately predict a commute. You know, in a perfect world, you can show up to a train station and there's a train hopefully just a few minutes away. Um, but that is not always, always the case. The last uh, definition is dwells, which is the time spent at station. So you'll see if you go Alewife to uh, Park Street today, you might spend eight uh, to 10 minutes just hanging out, waiting for people to get on the train. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we can see this stat um, really uh, interestingly when we talk about the new MBTA fare program that's coming out, we'll be able to tap on doors um, with the new Green Line trains and as well as buses. So that will hopefully make it so the dwell time goes down. So folks, you know, can get on the train quicker. Folks can get on the train quicker. It's a faster commute for everybody. Uh, the second the second uh, big part of our dashboard is uh, the slow zones. Um, so here is a, is a graph of just one day um, in 2022 for a Broadway to South Station on, on the red line. And you'll see around 11 a.m., for, for some reason, it decided to just be a minute slower. And you're like, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> I wonder if we, uh, you know, maybe this happens a couple of days in a row. Maybe it's a one off, you know, like before we were ever tracking any of this, we would just notice, you know, occasionally that, wow, it's, you know, between Harvard and Central, it seems slower than it used to be. Right. Uh, and we can see it in the data. So what happens if we aggregate this, you know, over a longer period of time? We have something like this where you can clearly see that, you know, between early May and early June of 2022, there was a, a clear slowdown of about, you know, almost a minute um, between Broadway and South Station. And you'll also notice that it got a little bit faster, but still not as fast as it once was. Uh, this can be attributed to either the MBTA shortening the track length um, where they have to go slow, um, or they can increase the, uh, you know, the speed that they're allowed to go on that segment of track, but it still might be less than what was, was originally had. So uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is like, how do we calculate, uh, these slow zones, right? Uh, we're using publicly available MBTA data, um, you know, before the MBTA and, you know, was transparent with any of their slow zones, right? Like we had to figure out some sort of algorithm or heuristic to determine when are trains going slower uh, than normal. So here's a here's a graph of um, Harvard to Central on the red line, uh, pretty much for all the data that we have, right? And you can clearly see in 2016, it was going pretty fast. It got slow in 2018. In COVID, it was the fastest it's ever been, probably because not a lot of people were on the trains. So it doesn't seem fair to use that as a baseline for, for calculating slow zones. Um, so what, what we decided to do after doing some all fancy math calculations, machine learning, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We were like, what if we just took the median and, and called it a day? And that was a pretty, you know, a pretty good decision. It's easy to explain. And it would give us a, a graph like, like this. So we would say, all right, in Harvard, Harvard to Central, let's find places where there are day, four days in a row where trains go 10% or slower than normal. And you'll see here, there are some clear, some clear places where, you know, it goes up 200 seconds, uh, even, so even 300 seconds, right? Which is, that's a pretty, that's a pretty good chunk of time. Um, here's a, a little kind of graph about our, our infrastructure that we have. Um, all of it is run on Amazon Web Services. We basically take data from the MBTA, store it, and then run run an algorithm every night to figure out where the slow zones are, and then we show it in our uh, in our web app, which is available on mobile. And I think it, I think it looks pretty good. Um, so here is a here's what it looks like. Just kidding. Um, here's a, here's an early draft of what uh, we envisioned our slow zone tracker to be. Um, and uh, another volunteer at Trans Matters, Austin, had had the algorithm that I was describing earlier about finding slow zones, and he gave me this and was like, "Could you make it something that looks like this so we could show it?" And I said, "Give me, give me a few weeks." And then, and then we had something like this. Uh, of course, a lot of other volunteers uh, 
help me out with this. But this was the, you know, from conception to this is what you see if you go on our on our dashboard right now. Um, you can go and look at slow zones for every single line, um, northbound, southbound, um, and you can click into them and it'll take you right to the aggregation um, where you can see over time, like, wow, between, you know, the, the 10th and, and, you know, the 21st in 2022, uh, from June to July, there was a slow zone between Wellington and Assembly. And it's, and it's clear as day. But I, an important thing to remember is that during this time, did we hear anything about these slow zones from the MBTA? We, we did not, <laughs> unfortunately. So uh, this was our, our attempt to, you know, be able to point to something and say, hey, MBTA, we know that the trains are getting slowed, you know, slowed down for some reason, right? Like, could you give us an explanation? Could you let us know that you're right, it is going slower than normal? So for us, this was really just a sanity check and validated the, the rider experience that like, yes, things are slower than they once were. Uh, another feature of our uh, of our dashboard is this cool line map. Uh, you know, when you're talking about geospatial things like transit maps, you know, it's uh, it's kind of nice to have this this uh, representation similar to you know an MBTA line map where you can see like you know between um, I can't remember when this screenshot was taken, but you know between Tufts and uh, and Rubbles, there seems to be a clear a clear you know group of slow zones or you know, between Beachmont and Maverick on the blue line, you know, there's a clear, there's a clear bunch there, right? So maybe they're all related, maybe not. We we don't, we don't really know. Uh, another another stat that we that we like to have is kind of a big overall like how are things going is total slow time, which uh, basically is if you took a line from front to back both directions, how much extra time would be added to your commute, uh, you know. So as a general sense of, you know, this is like a total line health kind of situation. Um, and you can see in 2022, you know, blue line was doing pretty good. Um, orange line started creeping up there and red line kind of just kind of took off on us. Uh, we also have uh, some stats about service uh, in the dashboard. This is really interesting to think about you know, in the post COVID transit world where, you know, folks, including myself, you know, have a hybrid schedule or can work from home, you know, whenever. Um, so, you know, to last, uh, oh, we're still in February, almost in March, but this month, you know, the, there was only 51% of the historical maximum of folks taking the red line as there was pre COVID. And you think about, wow, that's a lot of money that the MBTA does no longer have and needs to get somewhere. <laughs> This is an also a pretty pretty jarring graph, I think, which is the the amount of scheduled round trips on the red line per hour compared from 2019 to now. And you can see during rush hour, it's almost half. So the red line is running half the amount of service that it was pre-COVID. Yes, there are less riders, but for those riders who still rely on the service, this means that it's more unreliable because the trains aren't coming as often. You have to wait longer. Your commutes get longer, right? So when all the talk about slow zones and everything, this is kind of a stat that doesn't get talked about as much, which is the MBTA just isn't running as many trains as it once did, right? Um, and here's, here's another graph of, of ridership, right? So not only is the service lower but there's just not as many people riding the train as, as i mentioned earlier you know we've got the blue line has kind of been the best one um but you know the green orange um and the red are you know 50 percent or lower uh pre-covid ridership and a lot of other you know trans agencies are, are feeling uh similar similar pains and trying to figure out how do we get people back on the train so this uh this is, I kind of want to switch gears a little bit and talk about how we see our tools as being a greater part of the, the conversation with transit in the Boston area. Um, and, and I kind of see it as like these three 
pillars of, of what you know how data how uh, data backed advocacy can be used for good. Um, and I want to kind of frame that with our data dashboard and slow zone tracker over the past uh, couple of years. So you know when we released our slow zone tracker um, in 2022, uh, almost two years ago, um, you know it was amongst a group of transit enthusiasts, right? Um, you know, not not everyone is thinking about slow zones, or at least they weren't in 2022 uh, when when these things happened. But you know, we released our tools and we started seeing like, wow, there are there are people that one we don't know, and, and you know, two finding our tools organically talking about slow zones, right? Um, you know, these are both uh, tweets, and one says, you know, a rider next to me on this slow red line to Braintree is looking at the transit matter slow zone tracker and travel time tracker the red line, and yes. <laughs> this red line ride is still slow. No speed restrictions removed despite all the summer weekend shutdowns. And right, our tool is the one that's validating that rider experience. Uh, the next one is one of my personal favorites, which is I don't like that there's a new slow zone between AL Life and Davis, but I do like that the slow zone tracker at least tells me I'm not imagining it. So, you know, this is again reiterating that the MBTA is not talking about this uh, in 2022 um, or, you know, even until 2023, really. And you know we're able to say, here's a tool that tells you you're not crazy, right? Which I think is really powerful. And you know when your experience is validated with data, like there's no there's no lie, right? Like that's that's how it is. You can take this tool and say, talk to your friends, talk to your coworkers, like you know post on social media, right? You can you can start uh, getting some chatter going. Um, you know once once you have folks talking about your tools. Um, and things get enough attention, uh, sometimes, you know, the perfect uh, storm happens for us, which happens to be the, the famous, uh, you know, almost a year and a half ago now, um, the, the short notice 30-day uh, shutdown of the Orange Line, which was pretty big news for, for a while at the time, right? Um, and this was really the first time that the MBTA has said we are going to fix slow zones and here's where they are. And after these 30 days, the whole line, you know, with two, three weeks notice, we're shutting down. These slow zones will be gone. And we said, all right, we'll, we'll see, like, we'll track it. And, you know, maybe, maybe they will, maybe they won't. Um, and, you know, here's a graph of the total slow time uh, before and after the shutdown. Um, so, you know, the, the globe, uh, with, you know, a front page story using our data saying, wow, um, the orange line shutdown actually made things a lot slower for, you know, a month and a half after you know, their big press conferences and, you know, they're shipping out the orange line trains on the pike, you know, to the junkyard and everyone's ready waving and we did it, we did it, you know, short time span, blah, blah, blah. And turns out, that wasn't actually the case, and our data proved it. Right um, after that, there was a little there was a little more drama um, where both senators from uh, Massachusetts uh, called the the then general manager of the MBTA, um, along with some other city city and state officials, to basically ask, you know, what's going on? There's all these safety incidents this past these past couple of years, derailments famous train on fire over the, you know, over the mystic, right? Um, you know, what's going on? And Ed Markey just says it, you know, things would, th you said things were going to go faster. Um, Transit Matters says that it's not, right? What's going on? Um, and in that meeting, um, we got a verbal, you know, uh, promise to, uh, that the MBTA was going to release it's slow zone data. Um, and in a great surprise, in January of 2023, the MBTA became the second transit agency in the nation to make all of its slow zone information public. Um, the only one that also does it is the Chicago uh, Transit Authority, which was a big win because we felt like, wow, we kind of we kind of introduced the term slow zone into into the narrative you know our tool is being used as validation right like we're not doing any crazy analysis you know no fancy algorithms it's just are these trains going slower than they once did for a couple of days in a row and yeah they they were 
Um, and then here's here's a here's 2023, uh, where in March there was a system wide 25 mile an hour speed restriction that was imposed, which was, you know, we we kept saying after the orange line shut down, I I bet it can't get any worse. And <laughs> and the MBTA was like, just just you wait. Uh, so you see, at one point in April, it was an hour and 20 minutes extra on the red line. If you went front and back, that's a long time. <laughs> um, and, you know, luckily now we're, we're starting to see things um, come down, which was uh, one of the first shutdowns last, uh, last fall um, at, the, at the south end of the red line. Um, we were able to, you know, confirm that, hey, the MBTA shut down for a couple of weeks and they actually made it better, right? Which wasn't the case with a couple of other shutdowns that happened. So, um, and, you know, we still have media using our tools. I think we had over 50 mentions uh, in major Boston newspapers last year, just of our dashboard alone, um, which is really, really great. And... Then late last year, after all this happens, new general manager of the MBTA, everything's happened. Orange line shut down, trains on fire, this and that. The MBTA says, we're actually just going to get rid of all of them this year. And it's been happening, uh, which has been really great. So here's uh, some optimism for 2024. Um, this is, uh, if you've been a red line rider north of Park Street, you you know, for the past couple of weeks have uh, been in a lot of nice, uh, big, comfy buses, but it probably took you a lot longer to get to your destination than it normally did. Um, but the, the red line between Alewife and Park Street had some of the, the biggest and longest slow zones where trains were going 10 miles an hour for, you know, 2,500 feet, 3,000 feet of track, right? Um, so we managed to go from, you know, 28, almost 30 minutes to just over 20 minutes which is, you know, saving of six, six, seven minutes, which is, yay, thank you, MBTA, you know, you, you did it. And then I was like, wait a minute, what if I showed, what, how, how fast was it last year? Uh, actually, it's, it's still slower than it was a year ago after all the slow zones were fixed. Uh, so there's still a lot of work to do, basically. <laughs> um, but, you know, when you're an advocate, um, you need to be hopeful, right? The whole point of Transit Matters and Transit Matters Lab is to create these tools and use them for accountability for other folks to do their own advocacy, whether it's just being aware of what's going on with the MBTA or telling friends or, you know, showing up to a MBTA general board meeting and being brave and going up to the podium. I don't think, I don't think I would ever be brave enough to do that, but you know, that's what, that's what power, you know, that's, that's where the power is with, with this type of advocacy, right? And um, we're really hopeful that the MBTA will, you know, this year turn it around and we would love to see all the slow zones gone. Um, and then hopefully we can focus on, on the future of the MBTA instead of, you know, it's, it's massive backlog of things that need to be fixed. So that's, that's it. Um, there's a lot of other people who worked on these tools, not just me. Um, so shout out to all of them. And I also like to reiterate, we're all volunteers, you know, have normal day jobs. This is our nighttime, you know, fun muckraking uh, activity where we stare at train data all the time. But yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Looking forward to any questions. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Seth. Uh, digital round of applause, I'm sure, is uh, is blasting off in the chat. Um, if I wasn't muted, you would have heard me audibly say wow uh, when you brought up the uh, service graphic. Um, so it's really useful uh, to me, at least, to see some of, to see you interpret some of the things that we're seeing with this data, which obviously there's a big difference between the availability and accessibility of data, right? And then how do you actually make sense of it? So you all have done such amazing work to help us not only make sense of data, but actually turn it into actionable uh, ch changes in our everyday lives. Um, I mentioned before that 
we're moving into the Q&A section of the program right now. So uh, I welcome folks who are joining us online to uh, drop a question or a comment uh, into the chat. Um, we'll do our best to address them. And I'll go ahead and, and kick it off with a question about the slow zones, which uh, obviously a huge topic of this work. Um, you mentioned that MBTA's slow, increasing slow zone transparency. Um, my understanding is that their published slow zones often differ from the, the slow zones that Transit Matters calculates. Can you elaborate a little bit on how they're the same and how they're different? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we obviously the T, you know, they're on the inside, right? Like they've got all they've got all the juicy data of how long of you know, how long the track of the slow zone is, how slow it has to go, how it's changed over time, right? Um, and we are just simply using travel time data, right? Uh, we get notified and we ingest all this data that says a train entered the station, a train exited the station, and that's all we get to work with, right? Um, so the MBTA has a much more granular view of things, which is nice. Um, and it's really great that they put it out there so folks can know. Um, but yeah, there is, you know, just a, a difference in how we're able, you know, to track slow zones, right? We just have a different, uh, we have a different, different way to get there. But at the end of the day, when the MBTA released their slow zones list, the first thing I did was put theirs and put ours right next to them and be like, yep, 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 we, we've got them all. Okay. So we're, you know, our algorithm did, did something, right? Yeah, that's great to have, to be able to compare that evidence to. Um, we're getting a lot of really wonderful questions in the chat. So I'm going to pivot over there. Um, Rachel Corey asks, have you spoken with the T's data team to improve their slow zone tracker and their data analysis in general? Um, good question. So we have, um, like I mentioned at the beginning of, uh, of my presentation, um, the MBTA is very generous uh, with the amount of data that they provide. Um, they have their own processes and limits of what they're comfortable sharing, right? Um, so we, we're always in communication with them and they're also very forthcoming about any changes that are going to be made to the data that they're, that they're giving us. I think we are by far the biggest uh, consumer of said data. So I think it would be a pretty big story if the MBTA was like, MBTA shuts off advocacy group from, from data. So they've been pretty open with us about, you know, things changing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we actually... You know, we've had a, a few Transit Matters volunteers actually end up going and, and working at the MBTA. So there's folks who are actually trying to make it better, <laughs> I promise. Um, and all those people who work at the technology department of the MBTA are all just huge transit fans, like trying to do the best with what they have in a public, in a public job, right? Which is, I think, what everybody who holds some sort of public job is trying to do. So... Um, yeah. Yeah, it's really great to know that there's lots of allies too at the T who share our um, mission and values too and are doing the best they can from the inside as well to make a better transit network. One of the things that really struck me from your presentation was how many scales this work has affected, right? Not just at the local scale, but moving up to, to you know, regional and state level uh, interventions uh, into improving the system. Um, which I think is sort of related to, to what you were just reflecting on there about partnering with the T. We have another question from uh, Chris Kovac, um, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing anybody's names. What type of response have you seen from Philip Eng uh, on the slow zone data? Well, um, I think the the greatest one that we could ask for, which is we're going to, oh, there's Jared, our, our general, general director. Hi, Jared. Uh, he's uh, he's the one that you might see on all of the MBTA's uh, podcasts and stuff. So yeah, they, we have a pretty good relationship with them. Um, but you know, basically, Bill, you know, came in and said, "I've had enough of this. Like, we're gonna get rid of them," uh, which is 
at the end of the day, the goal, right? Um, better service is better, you know, faster service, better service helps everybody. It helps the economy. It helps folks get to work on time. It, you know, it helps, you know, when you can rely on transit on a public, on a public good, right? Like, it's so much easier. Uh, and it would be so great if we didn't have to worry about our transit agency working, right? But I think the MBTA has been very open about its long history of disinvestment and is, you know, trying to right the ship, yeah. which uh, is really the only thing that we can hope for. And we've gone directly to um, board of directors meetings as well to speak um, with general manager Ang and also the board of directors and um, secretary of transportation about um, the issues with the T, particularly with slow zones. Um, one of the uh, examples I can give two of our advocacy. So um, like Seth showed in the slides, um, when there was that 25 mile per hour speed restriction, um, so there was a show your Charlie card kind of policy implemented where you could ride the commuter rail um, not technically for free, but for free um, by showing your Charlie card if um, commuter rail was alongside a normal subway stop. Um, and this policy was really great. We had a ton of positive feedback on this policy change. Um, and while slow zones were still increasing um, and changing, you know, this policy was still in intact. And then unrelated um, with the Sumner Tunnel closure over the summer, there was other policies um, initiated to help alleviate um, any of the fallout there, um, such as the free blue line, for example. And then when those pro uh, policies were sunsetted, similarly, so was that show your Charlie card policy, but was unrelated to Sumner Tunnel. Um, so actually one of our labs members and I testified at testified at a board meeting um, and shared what we had from the slow zone tracker and said, actually our slow zones are increasing um, and we should not end this policy. And I will say, as long as the policy did not come back but we did, you know, continue to hear, you know, work being done from the T on how to address the slow zones. Um, and it wasn't, you know, shortly after until we got that um, year, the multi-year or year and a half-ish uh, long diversion plan, um, which we now a few months into and seen lots of success from. Yeah, I mean, even if, you know, even if some of the desired policies didn't come back into effect, it feels so important to have people who can be in the room and speak really, um, really richly about the data that exists, right? I mean, one of our previous exhibitions, I always think about this case we had on the wall called Data as Testimony. And I think of this sort of data as a really powerful kind of testimony for um, building a better transit system. Uh, many more amazing questions. Angela Lay has asked, as a transit advocate, what can we realistically do with this data? How can we translate data into actionable change? A really awesome question. Yeah, I think that was the the mission statement from the start with the inception of Transit Matters Labs, right? It's, we have this information, uh, so what, right? That's kind of the question that I like to ask myself a lot is I can show a graph of, what's happening and you can say, great, my train was slower than it, it was before. Um, but like, how do you, you know, how do you take that and tell a story, right? That's really where I think we have shined. Um, and there's, you know, a lot of great work going on to use data to tell stories, right? And stories are the things that get in the headlines, right? Like telling, mapping a data to a story about, you know, someone who has decided to Uber instead of taking the train now, and, you know, their monthly transportation bill has gone up immensely, but they have to do it because they can't rely on the T, right? And we can say, we know exactly how long your commute is taking, right? And how much longer it was, it, or it is now than it was before, right? And mapping, the data to the rider experience and those stories is really what I think pushes pushes change, right? Um, and there's you know there's so much data out there, and it really just takes one person to say, "I'm going to try and figure something out here." You know, I'm going to try and see if there's something I can take this and 
push it through the right the right lanes to hopefully get somebody to notice about it, right? And social media is 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 a lane, right? Showing up to the general manager's meeting is a lane. You know, there are ways for you to have your voice be heard, and we're, we're you know uh, thankful that there are opportunities for us to have our voices be heard, and that folks at the TR. Uh, receptive to things that we have to say and that riders have to say, right? So, you know, it's it's easy to to feel uh, like, you know, how can we possibly make change? You know, how can we possibly, you know, do X or Y, right? But you really just have to try and see where it goes, right? Like if you told me two years ago that, you know, I after a couple of weekends of work, uh, you know, I would be here, right? <laughs> like talking about how my tool, you know, helped make the MBT better, right? I would have said like, you're crazy, but here we are. Um, and so I think our story is a testament to, you know, that uh, that framing and that, and that mindset. And I encourage folks to continue to do that because there are lots of other things out there like bike data, you know, all sorts of things that you can take and try and tell a story about and, you know, put it up the right channels to hopefully um, get something done and make some change. Well, maybe a question that dovetails off of that one uh, is asked by Brett Powers. Um, I imagine that one way people could make a change is by joining Transit Matters or Transit TM Labs as a volunteer. Um, is there a direct way to get involved, Brett asks, with the TM Lab as a volunteer? Absolutely. Um, we have tons of volunteer opportunities. Um, we have a volunteer interest form on our website. Um, so anyone is welcome to submit one of those. Um, but if you want to bump up your request in the queue, I will say we do get a ton of interest. Please feel free to shoot me an email. My email is on our website. Um, it's just kcalandriello at transitmatters.info. Um, but we've got tons of fun projects in in the queue that we can't reveal just yet. Um, but if you're looking to do some work on um, data analysis or software development, uh, we've got really great things coming up. Yeah, I, I'd also encourage if you you do not need to be a full time software engineer to look at this stuff, right? Like we've worked with, um, you know, high school kids trying to get internship experience or folks who are, you know, in college trying to do extracurricular projects, right? Um, and we're all super nice and, and welcoming, right? And happy to teach and encourage and, you know, help folks who are curious, even just about like how any of this stuff works. Um, you know, we're more than happy to to take, take someone under our wing. Um, I'd also, I, I failed to mention, but all of our code is all open source which means that all of our tools, you can go and look at the code and also contribute to them without even really being a part of our organization. Um, so if you're interested in that at all, I, I encourage you to go look at our GitHub, which is just Transit Matters. It has the code for our dashboard, our, you know, everything's in there. Um, so it's it's all there for anyone anyone to see and contribute to. Great, thanks for that. Um... We have a few more questions, uh, which is wonderful. Um, Community Design Partnership asks uh, or poses the larger question is how we can use the data to drive MBTA improvements so the customer experience improves markedly. Riders are being asked to put up with a great deal. Uh, you've already spoken quite a bit about some of the improvements that, that uh, we've begun to see, or at least the responses on behalf of the MBTA, but uh, yeah, what do you make of this sort of issue about rider experience? It, yeah, it's all it's it's all connected, right? Uh, the ridership experience is not just how fast your train goes or how often it comes. It's the are the stations well lit? Do do I feel safe at this bus stop with no light on the side of a highway? Right, uh, standing on somebody's lawn, <laughs> you know. Like there are so many different parts of the MBTA that are, uh, you know, doing really great work to make rider experience better. I think some of the programs at Transit Matters are also directly uh, contributing to that. You know, with our mobility hubs uh, work and our work with, uh, you know, LR uh, LTAs. Um, you know, there. You just have to. Uh, 
hope, right? And and do what you can, right? Like the MBTA is a a monolith. It you know employs thousands of people. It's uh, you know it's a public good. Things don't move quickly, unfortunately. Um, but you know it's going to take a while to right the ship. Um, but I think we're all hopeful it turns and matters, and you know hopefully to continue to work with the MBTA to make things better. Um, and you know there are there are good things coming. We just voted to make the new Green Line trains look kind of gray and green, you know, on Twitter, which was fun. Um, you know, the Orange Line trains are new. We're getting the new fair stuff soon. Like you know, there are things that that have been in the works for you know a long time that that are coming to fruition now, as well as hopefully getting rid of all those slow zones this year. So I think there's I think there's room for optimism. Yeah, I would also say too on the bus side um, with the rider experience or customer experience, if you will. Um, something too that we find is a lot of um, riders who don't necessarily identify as transit nerds don't quite understand what bus bunching is and think it's maybe intentional or don't realize that it's an issue. Um, and this is something that we're really trying to address on um, the bus team and also actually using data from the labs team um, to help address these issues in an upcoming project um, by looking at the most bunched routes. Um, and then also using, you know, our data findings to write a report and then collaborate um, with the MBTA and also municipal leaders and community organization organizations on how, um, you know, we can work together to build a better bus party infrastructure and implement operations practices that help alleviate um, bus bunching, which makes, you know, this rider experience better, and then can also in the future drive mode shift and just create a better transit network. But it all starts with the data um, that our labs team has found and interpreted for us. Great. We have another question from uh, Kevin Chan. Um, Kevin asks if there are any enhancements to the slow zone data dashboard in the works. And I'll sort of tack Kevin's second question on. Uh, which is is adding commuter rail to the data dashboard part of uh, the for the future projects. It sounds like maybe you all have some projects that you can't speak to, but perhaps this is something that you that you could if we're lucky. Yes, it is. It is most certainly on the way, and on the way as in I I, I looked at it today. Um, so the the MBTA their open um, you know things that we use don't always uh, doesn't always have all the data that we would like. Um, so we are basically building our own like separate data collector that will take data from every train, every bus, every commuter rail and store it all for us so that we can kind of remove the middleman of the MBTA almost, you know, out of the picture. Um, and so we will be collecting the same sorts of data that power like the Google Maps transit stuff or the Apple Maps transit stuff where you can see, you know, they they hook into these transit feeds, almost like an RSS feed or a blog feed kind of that that put out notifications. Uh, and so we're going to be using them in the same way as these like transit apps do. Um, and using that, we're able to get all that commuter rail information, all the bus information um, and all of that will be coming soon. We're, we're basically just making sure that it works as, as we like to and uh, there's no there's no gaps like like as I, as I mentioned we're all volunteers trying to you know hammer and tinker things away uh, in our free time so it's definitely it should be coming pretty soon for uh, more bus data and commuter rail data yes i'm particularly really excited about the bus data if you can't already tell um but we've slowly been adding a few more bus routes to our data dashboard um and with this upcoming bus project on bus bunching and slow buses um you will see some more buses added to our system um but yeah we're really excited to get that bus information on there as well because we know that um sometimes people care about the subway a little more than the bus but the bus definitely needs a, a bit more of a leg up <laughs> Very exciting stuff on the horizon. Um, Kevin had a, another question that uh, other people might be interested in on this call. Kevin asked if you can volunteer for TM Labs uh, remotely. Uh, if someone lives in the DC area, for example, but goes to Boston a lot, or maybe even remotely volunteer entirely. What's your policy on that? 110%. Um, one of our previous co-leads of labs actually moved to Brooklyn and still worked with us for, for years, even though he 
didn't even ride the tea that much anyway, only only when he came home to visit family. Um, so yeah, it's totally, totally possible. We have no, um, you know, I guess the only thing you would miss out on is sometimes we get together in person and have, you know, snacks and whatnot. Um, but, you know, other than that, we are totally async, remote, friendly, hybrid, all the all the buzzwords on there. We are, you know, open to, open to anyone and everyone. Yeah, I think we've got, I think, three New Yorkers from our um, volunteer team, which is exciting. But if you, we could definitely take on a, a DCer. Awesome. Well, it's great to know that that's an option, I'm sure, for lots of people on, on, the, uh, on the call today. Um, a, a couple more questions before we we'll start to wrap up in a few minutes. So if anybody does have lingering questions, uh, try to get them in uh, soon. Um, David Knudsen has asked, I think, a really interesting question. Does, does Transit Matters also do data analysis of MBTA financial data, for example, not just performance, but maybe looking at oper capital versus operating budgets at other transit agencies, or maybe comparing different aspects of driver compensation? That is really interesting. We, we do not currently, but now my, my interest has peaked. Yeah, the most, the closest thing to that we've done is um, for the CIP process, which happens every year. It's the five-year um, capital investment plan that's updated yearly. Um, we'll look at, you know, where funds are going and analyze if it's being spent towards diesel investments, electric investments, or hybrid investments. Um, it's almost a year old, but if you scroll back on our social media, Instagram or Twitter, um, you can find some pie charts we made. Um, but of course, you know, the pie charts are not as um, data intensive as a lot of the work of the labs team has done. Um, but we do hope to expand on that again with this upcoming CIP season. Um, we expect to get a draft of this in March. Um, and, you know, we've looked at, you know, compared the, you know, pays of um, operators across um, networks, but not done a true data analysis. But if that is something you're interested in, please uh, show some interest in being a volunteer. I would. I'd also um, recommend the uh, Streets blog, uh, Mass uh, blog, who's uh, they do a lot of stories about transit, uh, you know, urban planning, et cetera. And they just did a really good story on um, the T and the, you know, the, the Governor Healy's announcement of uh, the T getting more funding and things like that. And what does that mean? Is that, you know, is it really more funding, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of good articles about out there about the T's budget. Um, but I, yeah, I definitely think it's something that we could for sure look at. And in terms of our advocacy as well, a lot of this isn't um, really happen campaign facing with the volunteers because a lot of this happens um, during the work day because it's a lot of like going to the state house or going to other coalitions with other organizations that do this kind of work. Um, but we do work a lot, um, you know, with similar organizations that do mobility or urbanist work um, on just, you know, ways we can advocate for fun, uh, funding the T. And if you are interested in more information on that, I would recommend going to mbta.com slash events and then scrolling back to the most recent board meeting. And there's some really interesting slides about the history of MBTA funding um, and what how the CIP is made and how that's funded. Um, so if you're looking for something interesting to read, I would recommend. For me, the MBTA general managers meetings are like a new Marvel movie. You know, you just you just got to watch. You never know. You never know what's going to happen. Yes, and if you're not available at um, 11 a.m. on a Thursday, which I think most people probably aren't, um, we do recap the board meetings on Twitter um, for a more accessible version. Amazing, some hot insider tips. I did not know about this, but now I'm gonna have to catch, uh, yeah, the next like Marvel movie-esque release of the general manager's board meetings. Uh, we have a question from Glenn Berkowitz in the chat that I would love to squeeze in before we we wrap up here. And it's a pretty specific question, I think. Um, question about your new vehicle tracker. Is there a way to track the reliability of each new car that enters revenue service? For example, if a new car, uh, if a new car consists, comes on a line, uh, but then goes offline for a certain minimum time, uh, that might help teach us something about the reliability or even quality of the new builds. That is that is really interesting. Our um, we do have some data 
and we do know you know all the trains all have a number right um which is kind of fun because you're like oh i've been on car four five six seven before you know um and you might see folks on social media tweeting like oh car xyz doesn't have the ac on or something like that right so all these cars have a number and they can be tracked um and so i believe we do get information about cars and uh, when they come online and when they go offline which is a way that we uh, we're able to track which cars are new or old on, on the new train tracker i don't think we've ever done any tracking about you know particular bad actors of you know oh this car is always out of service etc um but given the you know i i think it was last year there were some stories about the orange line trains having problems and coming offline and going online so i think yeah it could be interesting to look at um and you know trying to figure out if there's some uh, some trains that just weren't <laughs> weren't built the way they were supposed to some some problem uh, problem actors out there but yeah that's really a quick great great question glenn We've got a comment in the chat that sort of responds uh, to one of the questions. Um, Datadyne007, I wonder if this is maybe a TM Labs person, but some of our board members, particularly Chris Friend, do specifically analyze MBTA financial data like Ops vs. Capital and use it to shape policy statements sometimes. I think that's um, Tim Lawrence. Yes. Hi, Hello, Tim. Tim. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Great. Transit Matters well, is the interim president. Right, Katie? Yeah. So yeah, Tim's, Tim's with us for sure. <laughs> well, as we've reached the end of our program, we've just got, and yes, we have confirmation that it is Tim Lawrence. Um, as we reach the end of our program for tonight, I'm going to try to squeeze one more very quick question in for you all. I mentioned at the top of this call that we have a transportation uh, sort of cartography challenge up at the at the map center in our vestibule. We asked for speculative maps that imagine a new sort of transit system in Boston. Um, in your dream transportation system, uh, what are some of the key features or what does it look like, like for your everyday lives? Um, whew, I really, we, we need the, if it was up to me, bring back all the streetcars, you know, Somerville community, you know, community path that used to be a streetcar, you know, the winter Hill station, right. Uh, the, the 57 bus, you know, used to be a streetcar, right. There's all these, all these, uh, you look at a map from like 1910, right? You'll see trains everywhere. Uh, so, you know, in my perfect world, we get back to that. Um, but I think uh, an urban ring would be great, you know, to right now, all of the all of the trains all go into one central location. But for example, if you live in Somerville and you're trying to get to Alston, you know, to go see a concert or something, you've got to go all the way downtown, all the way out, or if you're like me and you, go to Red Sox games all the time. Mm -hmm. you know, I go all the way from West Somerville, all the way downtown, all the way, you know, back out to Fenway. And it takes like an hour, an hour and a half. Um, uh, sometimes I'll just, I take the bus, you know, which will go from Harvard Square to Alston, yeah. which is kind of nice. But um, yeah, I think that would be for me a dream and just better connection between the lines, really. I'm going to jump in just to make sure we have enough time. Katie, do you have one? I would probably say, and I think this would be... A there could be a really creative way to show this on a map. Um, but having, you know, 24 hour service would be one of my biggest dreams for sure. Yeah. Um, and then I'd also have to agree with Seth that I'd love to see more connection, particularly with red to blue connector as a blue line rider myself. I would love to see that. And I'd love to yeah. access Cambridge uh, more easily. I'm a huge fan of honeycomb ice cream um, and I wish I could frequent it more. Uh, but Porter Square is a bit of a trek for me. Yeah. Well, on that note, thank you for both of those. And I love those answers because we address both of them in our show, Getting Around Town, which you all can come visit uh, on the chat or on the TM Labs team uh, at the Boston Public Library Central Branch down at Copley Square in the Leventhal Center Gallery. Um, we've posted a, a one minute survey that we would love for you all to take. Uh, it's in the chat here. Um, and just to conclude, if you enjoyed today's program, uh, I'm so glad. That's great. Uh, we have more that you can attend over the next few weeks on Tuesday, March 5th at 6 p.m. as part of our route, uh, Routes Ahead of Us conversation series. We'll be hosting a discussion about uh, building better and more equitable transportation and mobility systems with Stacey Thompson, Executive Director of Livable Streets. Um, and Reggie Ramos, Executive Director of Transportation for Massachusetts. We'll have another one of those events on Tuesday, March 26th, also at 6 p.m. 
uh, with uh, Dan Rosengard, Director of Transportation for Boston Public Schools. Um, those are both, again, a Newsfeed Cafe. Uh, we'll provide refreshments and snacks. Uh, they'll be available. Um, please come by and see us. There are lots of ways to stay involved with the Leventhal Center's work otherwise, uh, but the best way to keep up with what we do is to sign up for our biweekly newsletter, which we'll put a link to in the chat. And lastly, I just want to conclude by thanking Katie and Seth uh, for sharing their knowledge and their work with us. Um, and I want to thank everyone for tuning in. I'd also like to thank the mobility team of the Barr Foundation for their support of our exhibition and our programming. Uh, on that note, uh, one more time, round of digital applause. And thank you both for such a wonderful uh, presentation. Good night, and I hope to see everyone soon. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. Have a great night. Thanks, everyone, for coming.